Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&A's. I get a little bit of a late start today because I was working on an upcoming video. Hopefully I could get it done for this weekend, but if not, we'll see. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. I guess no spoilers, but hopefully you'll all see it within a few days or at worst a week from now. But anyway, let's jump into the questions. First up, over on YouTube subscriptions, Krebstar said they would like to use their Wii or GameCube in 480p on a multi-scan VGA CRT computer monitor via component video. Is the Garo the best option? They'd rather not hard mod any cables unless it's just way better. Um, they feel like I've addressed this, but with a cursory glance and can't find much, in much info. Uh, so, uh, first, thanks for the kind words, Krebstar, and I think I could point you in the right direction. So, the Garo would work. Um, there's been some issues with the Wii and the Garo, um, but I think it's related to the Wii because I had similar issues on a few different brand converters. Um, there's the converters from LinuxBot3000 on eBay, which uh, I haven't jumped too far into testing, but they seem good, and uh, his other stuff is pretty darn good too, so it would be a good roll of the dice. Uh, but there's also the GBS control, and while I would not recommend buying and modding one of these just to go from component to VGA, if you wanted to do anything else with this thing, if you wanted to use it for downscaling, if you didn't have any other scalers and you were thinking about maybe messing around with one, that might be the time. Um, the GBSC AIO, the all-in-one case, uh, should be available. The one I just showed, I talked about a while back. I believe that's available on Tindy. Um, it certainly was one of the posts. So even if you're not a modder, you could just pick one of those up pre-made. Um, and they're not not—they're going to be about the same price as any of these other converters. So overall, I would kind of just take that into consideration and, and see. Do you really only need component video to VGA? Or would you also like any other kind of features along with that? Um, so, and of course, you know, you could always use the open source scan converter for that, plug it into the component video of the OSSC, and then just get any cheap HDMI to VGA converter on the output side. And for 480p, set it to pass through mode. And for 240p and 480i, set it to deinterlacing. And that way you still get a 480p signal to go into your VGA monitor. So my advice, uh, you know, if you only need conversion, Garo should be fine. So should the Linux Bot 3000 and so should a few others out there. However, if you would like any other options along with that, including scan lines or anything else, look into the OSSC or the GBS control. And once again, just a polite reminder, not just one of those GBS 8200s, actually one with this, the new software that Rama designed installed into it. Otherwise, it's just a weird, laggy mess as opposed to GBSC, which is pretty awesome. Next over on YouTube subscription, Scooter140 said that they have three EverDrives and an OSSC in their shopping cart. The total is like 640 and they haven't even bought any SCART cables yet. They're hesitating to pull the trigger because they keep thinking how I could just get a mister for the fraction of the cost. They were wondering if I had any advice on going one way or the other. They've tried emulation in various ways and I'm always unhappy with the performance, but from what I've heard, the mister is pretty close to the real thing. On the other hand, I have all of these consoles I'd like to put to good use. Um, so... I do have an opinion on that, but please keep in mind, this is just an opinion. This is by no means, is it fact or anything like that? Um, but I, I very often think about the same thing as in terms of how I want to game. So, you know, I've had very bad experiences over the years and, you know, since the 90s with software emulation, with glitching and inaccuracies and lag. I've also had some good experiences, like especially with arcade emulation, but um it's my opinion these days that if you already own all of these original consoles, they're pretty amazing. And, you know, it's one of those things where the game itself, nostalgia lasts like a minute. And then if you're going to sit and play a game, it's because you love the game. It's not because of nostalgia. I don't think anybody would dump, you know, 40 hours into a game just, you know, because it reminds them of when they were kids. But you do absolutely get that feeling from the consoles, the cartridges and all that stuff. So... As far as gaming goes, because of space constraints and because of everything else, I've really been preferring the Mister, and I don't mind the the bumps in the road because much like software emulation, uh, you know the the Mister team sometimes gets annoyed when I say this, but the, I always tend to have some kind of issue. Is my controller not working today? Today, do I have to change something in a file? But for the most part, it's a really solid and awesome experience. And once the game starts playing, I've never had a problem with Mister. 
ever once it's actually playing and working and you have your controllers working and configured right. So I'm kind of at the place now where I'm wondering for myself, um, where exactly I'm going to be going in the future with my setup. Because remember, I have a ton of different consoles because I need them for testing. You know, there's no reason anybody should have five Super Nintendos, but I do for all the crap that I do. So I'm wondering, you know, do I have a CRT setup with original consoles and then play that when I want the full experience uh, and then keep Mr. specifically for when I want flat screen, when it's a console or game I don't have yet. And it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, the one thing that I personally would never want to do is just sell off all my consoles and use Mr. And that is nothing to do with the Mr. Project whatsoever. It's just, even though the games themselves mean a lot more to me than nostalgia, I do love having a Super Nintendo. I do, I've always thought the original Model 1 Sega Genesis is one of the coolest looking consoles ever made. And I don't ever want to give those up. And especially don't, I don't want to give up the controllers because I do feel like that adds to the experience. But I am myself starting to debate which one I would rather do. You know, when I'm sitting down to play a game, do I want something that, uh, you know, if I want to play a Sega Master System game, can I just sit down and play it and not have to worry about jail bars or not have to worry about, you know, anything else working? But on the other hand, I mean, if I want to play a 3D light gun Sega Master System game, do I really need to worry about pulling out a snack adapter? I, I don't think a 3D adapter works or is it even available for the Mr. yet? So in your situation... If you have the room for a CRT, I would seriously consider just having all your original consoles connected to a CRT for fun uh, and then using your Mr. for hardcore gaming. But once again, all of this four minutes of word vomit is just my opinion. And my opinions on this stuff change all the time. When I started Retro RGB, it was, I never ever want to use anything other than an original console, you know, and uh, ROM carts are awesome, but I would really prefer the original game if I could. And over the years, I just, I, I've really moved away from that and just decided why, that, you know, I do appreciate all of the original stuff and I'll never really get rid of any of that. Uh, but the actual gaming experience on the Mr. has pretty darn solid. So um, the only other thing to keep in mind is it is an ongoing project. While it's very solid, it is a work in progress. So while you could pretty much guarantee if your console's in good shape, you know, you don't need a cap replacement or anything like that, um, you know, you use decent power supplies, you could pretty much guarantee that when you take your cartridge, as long as everything's been cleaned, you could plug your cartridge into your console, you plug your controller in, you turn it on, and it works period. Whereas with an ongoing work in progress project like Mr., it might not be that way every single time. You know, you might turn on Mr., plug in your controller, and then your snack adapter doesn't work. You might want to do an update to get a new feature that's awesome, but that might change one of your settings, and you do get some of the downsides of emulation when you go through that. Um, I personally don't care. That's been a part of my life since I was a kid, but that is definitely something I wanted to address. And I think I saw a bunch of stuff on Twitter of what I think is uh, just people misunderstanding feedback. I saw somebody that I believe uh, works on the Mr. Project making a very funny joke about like, oh, people complain that they want Mr. to be more like analog, so why don't we, you know, only make three of them and, <laughs> and not let you buy them? You know, it was a funny joke, but I'm pretty sure the complaints are that, you know, if you buy a Mega SG, if, you know, if, assuming it's in stock, you plug in your controller, you plug in your console, you turn it on, and you're done. You know, and that that's all you have to do period. And that is something that I really want to try my best to help make the Mr. experience a little bit smoother. Um, but, you know, it's their project uh, and it's their decision on on what they want to implement and why they want to implement it. And very often, just like every other project, some of the times they say no might be because of a hundred reasons that they don't have time to explain to me why they can't just implement a feature that I thought would be cool. So I, I try to never bust their chops about it, but, you know, you just, it's something, whether they like it or not, it's something that you have to keep in mind and that if you're going to go down the road of Mr., there's going to be bumps in the road that you're not going to find on original hardware, but it might very much be worth it to you. So sorry for the super lengthy explanation, but there definitely was no easy way to answer that. Okay, over on Patreon, because there was nothing on Floatplane this week. Uh, Jens Jacob Christensen is working on a GBS control box, and they're using the 8220 because they would like to connect a CRT VGA monitor and a flat screen using HDMI. They've done all the suggested mods and would like to be able to use it with all RGB consoles as well as their Amigas. And now for the questions. 
They would like to add a SCART input to the box. Is it okay to just connect it up using the 8-pin wires that comes with the GBS, or do I need a resistor or a sync stripper on the sync line? Uh, you're probably going to need a sync stripper. Stuff like the... Um, I was actually just using my... I was just using exactly what you said, in fact. Um, I have a GBS 8220 that's hacked into uh, a prototype of the new all-in-one box. Um, and I was using the SCART cleaner that I had, uh, and that's just a converter, um, just a DVI to VGA converter. And that seems to work fine. Uh, the GBS control all-in-one project has exactly this built into it, so you don't need to worry. But I do believe you would need a sync stripper of sorts, and the voltage would need to be a little higher than most SCART devices would probably output. So yeah, a sync stripper is probably gonna be necessary. Um, and number two, can I just connect the sound input for from the SCART connector uh, to both the VGA and HDMI adapter and some phono jacks for use with the VGA connection. Yeah, as the as proved in the video that Steve and I did about testing audio on an oscilloscope, it is okay to split audio but not video from a console. So uh, if you have something like that where a SCART connector is going in. Um, and, you know, you could split the audio, one going into your HDMI converter, there should be like a 3.5 millimeter jack, uh, and the rest going out to your speakers or anything like that. Um, if your HDMI out is kind of already connected to some kind of stereo, I would just do it that way just because it'll probably be louder, there's less chance of anything going wrong. Um, but other than that, you could use Y connectors with audio and your setup should be fine. Um, I was just testing the, both my GBS boxes today for another video that should be out this weekend and uh, I really like them. And supposedly the, the new version of the GBS control all in one, the finished version should arrive to me any day now, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So uh, definitely love this project. Um, you know, I always try to be clear about it. It's not for everybody because you, it does require some tinkering. You know, it is an open source hack of an existing product. So sometimes there's some bumps in the road. There, are, I do occasionally have issues with VGA, RGB, HV specifically input, uh, but I do love it. So as long as you know what you're getting into, um, you know, it's a very fun project to mess around with. Oliver Clare wants to know if there's any such thing as good quality shielded HD RetroVision-esque solutions for RF and composite cabling. They're mainly thinking about plug-to-plug -plug solutions for connecting switch boxes. Um, so not really. There's less of an issue with composite video. Um, you will see a difference between like a complete garbage cable and a decent one. You absolutely will. Um, but you probably won't see a difference between a decent cable and a really nice super shielded one like the HD Retrovisions. Unfortunately, though, you never really know what you're going to get with some of these cables. And so... One suggestion is if you occasionally need to tinker and solder and make your own cables, you could buy one set of cables from Amazon, cut them in the middle and see if they're actually shielded. And if they are, great. You know, now you have that cable's cut, but you could use it for other projects, wire it directly into stuff, whatever you got to do, and then order a bunch more for your consoles. Uh, and if it's not shielded, you know, you may have just wasted some money, but you know, whatever. Um, but it's, it is less of an issue. So if you buy something that's that's claimed to be shielded on Amazon or Monoprice or any of those places. Hopefully they have reviews and, you know, always check and make sure there's some kind of fact behind people's reviews, but you know, see, see what people say you should be okay. Um, and you, I would really feel comfortable for RF and composite, just kind of doing that and not worrying about any expensive cables. Just once again, just make sure they're not total garbage, completely unshielded three strands of, you know, the 30 gauge wire or something like that. Bradley says the Neo Geo MVS X looks like one of the better attempts at creating a home arcade machine, but it still relies on software emulation. Other attempts at creating home arcade machines have been mixed. Given that Mr. has created many great arcade cores, including amazing, an, an amazing Neo Geo core, why don't these companies go the FPGA route? With the popularity of analog, it just seems like a missed opportunity to use FPGA instead of software emulation for those older arcade games, especially given that many of the arcade games ran on common flat common platforms like MVS, System 16, CPS2, all that stuff. Um, so the answer is money. Uh, while I certainly don't want to speak for other companies, especially ones that I've never dealt with, I could pretty much guarantee the answer is money. Um, 
to create an FPGA solution based off of an existing core, even a freaking awesome existing core, um, it means a few things. First of all, um, you would have to go by Mr.'s open source rules, which means that anything that you built around this, you would have to turn back over so that the community could use it. I feel like any company worth a shit, and sorry, but I'm just being honest, uh, would proudly do this, be knowing that even if you try to clone everything, or even if they make an amazing menu that people want integrated into Mr. or something, all that's going to do is reflect upon the work that you do and bring more attention to your project from the core group of people that you want their attention. Uh, but that's definitely something companies are, are definitely uncomfortable in saying, hey, I'm not going to hire, uh, or I'm not going to have my team of FPGA engineers you know, take all of this stuff, modify it for us, and then just give you the work that we did. I do understand that. I, there's a lot more to it, of course. Um, and there's also, depending on the, the open source rules and how to do it, I'm sure there's different ways that would benefit everybody. And the other uh, thing is, depending on what solution you're talking about, if there's cartridges involved, you would have to create something that reads the data off the cartridges. Uh, you know, you probably could do something like the Retron 5 where it dumps every th uh, the cartridge to a ROM first, but if you wanted to do it right, it's it actually would be a lot trickier than people would expect. Um, and so I think that's that's really the bottom line is you could spend zero dollars in development to take a software emulation piece that's been out forever, uh, modify it for yourself, throw it in a you know five dollar analog or um, uh, Android PCB and put it in a case and sell it for five hundred bucks and it'll be a very very good experience. Or you could spend a year developing something. Um, sell it for 600 make a ton less profit, and 99% of the people won't know the difference. So I'm not um, defending this. Uh, I'm just explaining the reason to you why I'm pretty sure we don't see that stuff. But I really hope it changes. I really hope people step up to it. And, you know, that's the other side of analog, right? A lot of the things that they do with their, you know, they're not making enough for everybody. You know, I, I did, throughout all of my criticism, I always defend them in that if they just went the other way and said, fine, let's make 50,000 of these and make sure there's enough for everybody. And people, a lot of people look at it and go, why would I spend 200 bucks on that thing when I could buy the the at games one for $80, you know, most people aren't going to realize <laughs> that there is a massive difference between the two. Most people are just going to see like that one looks like a mini Genesis and it's cheaper. I'm just going to buy it. Their company would go out of business if they did that more than once or, or possibly even once. I don't know anything about their financials. So there is a giant risk that I understand that most companies wouldn't want to take. That's why analog doesn't just make one of everything and hope that it works. Um, at least I'm pretty sure that's what it is, but I do, I really hope it changes. And I've been contacted by a couple of different companies that, that claim that they want to make this happen. But every time there's been something where I'm like, Oh, I don't, I think you're going to screw this up or I don't believe that you're doing it this way. Or there's a, there hasn't been one single thing so far that I've heard of that would be a perfect recreation of this. So Let's cross our fingers. Let's hope that some of these companies understand the benefits of going uh, of open source and take the time to try to mix, you know, a, a mixture of their own proprietary stuff with open source and everybody would kind of win on that one. But yeah, I mean, that's I'm pretty sure that's the answer to it. But as always, I mean, if I'm wrong, any of these companies could feel free to, to step up and explain their side of things. But I'm pretty sure it's just money and effort. Brento is having a hard time finding anything that can downscale an HDMI signal or VGA-based signal to play movies from their computer to display on their consumer-grade TV, uh, which does not have digital inputs, but I believe it does have component video inputs. I think I have the same one. Um, or even their PVM. They'd love to watch old movies on the CRT to get the full experience without having to rely on a VHS or DVD collection. Uh, they bought a unit from Amazon and it doesn't work at all. They read in the instructions that it doesn't support anything lower than 640 by 480. It's been very tough to find anything. Um, so do I use any product to do this? So there's two factors involved. Uh, resolution and signal. So all of these old TVs and most PVMs only accept 15 kilohertz signals, which is 240p for gaming and 480i interlaced for TV signals and also for gaming too. But so what you are actually asking is to take progressive scan modern resolutions 
and downscale them to interlaced. The easiest way to do this by far, without any doubt in my mind, is to take an original Xbox, a PlayStation 2, um, a PlayStation 3, or I guess even a Wii, although that doesn't seem to work as well for me, and play any of these medias through media players on that. So whether it's a Netflix show, whether it's uh, files that you're streaming off of your home server, that should be able to take care of that without any extra equipment, without any converters, nothing. All you would have to do is, you know, even if uh, your TV doesn't have component inputs, which it does, but even if it was only Compositor S video, you could still use Compositor S video cables from those consoles, uh, and that would take care of everything. It would downscale it all to 480i for you. If you specifically need to take your your computer and put it on there, you would have to do some kind of downscaling to go with that. Downscaling from 480p to 240p um, is fairly easy these days. I have the I'll have a video out on this very soon. Going from 480p to 480i, I believe, can be done as well with stuff like the Super Emotia, uh, which is kind of an expensive piece of equipment, but it would work. It would accept a component or VGA input at 480p and downscale it to, I believe, uh, either RGB S or S video or even composite 480i if you wanted. Um, so that's a, an expensive solution if you really needed to do that. I'll look into other ways to, to get the signal down to 480i. Um, I've tried downscaling 480p to 240p for video, and I didn't really like the way it looked. I mean, it was neat. Like, I think I watched an Angry Video Game Nerd episode in 240p once. That was fun, but that's not how, you know, that's not a good representation of what TV and movies were like. So the easiest way by far... You know, any console with a media player and TV apps in it, we PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, possibly others, um, definitely just use that. Uh, you know, I believe the Super Emotia is the only one I've tested that can go to 480i easily. Um, and any of the other downscaling solutions might be able to be tweaked for it. I know the Corio TV1 boxes probably could, uh, but I would look into that. Um, I would kind of look into those first. The consoles should be easiest. Monty was looking for an easy way to center images on their RGB monitor, uh, and they beat me to it. They asked if the Xtron RGB interfaces would be a good solution, and that's always what I've used when I needed an easy way to move an image around. Um, they were originally recommended to me by FUDA. I have bought, I probably bought 20 over the years and occasionally would give them to friends, and then I just found extras that I had laying around. So those have been my go-tos. Um, I haven't really found any problems with them, and I've occasionally needed them for other kind of sync combining and sync cleaning up solutions. I do occasionally run into one uh, where I'll plug it in and the image degrades, uh, but it could just be that I need to replace the capacitors in it, just like every other old analog equipment, or I could have just gotten a bad one, uh, but I've definitely owned RGB, Xtron RGB boxes that work perfect for this. So, and they're still fairly inexpensive. So I would start out with that, definitely. Um, you mentioned the 203 RXI. You don't really need the 203. I just liked that one because it had three inputs. Any of the Xtron RGB interfaces that have centering controls would work. And even if you find ones without power supplies, uh, you could just kind of look up the specs and then buy a cheap power supply and wire it in yourself. Uh, I bought a couple for like five bucks each or something over the years uh, and just wired in my own power supply, tested it, and then ended up giving them away to friends. So that would definitely work. Um, you asked, how am I using the three inputs? I direct connect everything these days, so I'm not. But at, at one time, I was having everything run from a SCART switch into VGA input one, a VGA switch into VGA input number two, and then uh, input number three, I just used as an easy way to, you know, I think I had like a cable dangling if I needed to plug a third in. So I essentially used it as a double switch as well as all of that. And in the previous setup I had, it was pretty handy because I was using an XM29. And um, sometimes when I'd go from 240p to 480p, the image would shift just like you said. So I'd be able to mess with it. Uh, but I just direct connect now. I don't have any room for a full setup. And lastly, they're planning on getting two of them, one for each screen, rather than having a complicated setup in a matrix switcher, uh, and put them at the end of the chain just before the CRTs. Is this the right place for them? And can they be set to just pass through if I don't need their processing? Um, I believe that's where I would put them in the chain. That's where I had mine. Uh, I don't think 
uh, you need to worry about anything if you're not using the centering. I think you can just set them to pass through. I would just check the sync on them. So if you're going into just CRTs, probably not going to be an issue whatsoever. But if you're going into a SCART device, like an OSSE, RetroTINK 2X SCART, something like that, um, I would just kind of see, I would just do a little research on the model that you're using and see what voltage sync it's outputting. And if it's outputting TTL level sync, you're going to need to have a special cable with a resistor in it that drops the voltage down before going into a SCART device. Uh, so that's just the last thing to check. But if you're just going into a bunch of different RGB monitors, you should be fine. Oliver Clare wanted to know if there's any substantial differences between uh, how BVMs, PVMs, and closed caption TV monitors operate, uh, and wants to know what are the most important specs to use when comparing PVMs. Um, you know, I'm sorry for this answer, but the truth is that the only thing that you need to compare is how it looks in front of you. Um, you know, if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, like let's just say hypothetically we could get into a time machine and go back when these things are coming straight off the assembly line. So they're all brand new and, and calibrated and perfect. You would look for line count. Then you would want to decide what line count looks better to you. Because to many people, too much detail on a CRT means that you don't see the mask anymore, which means it almost kind of looks like a flat screen, but with all of the downsides of a CRT. Whereas a lot of other people think if the uh, if the line count is too low, uh, they're in, especially on larger monitors, you would see more space between the characters on screen and it doesn't look as good. So you would have to then decide what looks better to your eyes. And then you would also have to decide what features do you want? Do you need RGB? Uh, do you only need S-Video? Um, are you going to need something that's compatible with 480p as well? Do you need widescreen support? You know, so generally, I mean, once you're at the point of owning one of these used monitors that are all old, you could have the best monitor that's ever been made, you know, the highest line count, the, the perfect setup for your eyes, everything's calibrated, and then you could have one that generally would have been regarded as like, meh, all right, that's all right. But if that one's in better condition, it's going to look way better than a beat up one of the best. So, you know, like I said, it's not a good answer because there's, uh, I, I'm sure you would have liked an answer like, oh yes, get model one, two, three, look for spec number two. But with used equipment like this, there's just absolutely no way uh, that you could possibly tell. And a perfect example is I bought a monitor with over a hundred thousand hours on it. That apparently when, uh, when it was opened up and checked, it has the original tube and it looks perfect. So it must have been something where they left it on all the time, but didn't pump a signal through it until they were using it. So while technically it was on and powered up and everything, it wasn't actually in use, so the tube didn't get worn down. And once the capacitors were replaced on the input boards, everything was pretty much like brand new again. So there's no easy way to tell. You have to just check it out yourself, see how it looks to your eyes, make sure it works with your setup. And the monitor that you mentioned picking up, a JVC that can be modified with an, a compatible RGB card, I have one of those. I have a 17-inch, and I, I love it. I might, I might even have the same version of yours. Mine does need some calibration. It probably could use a cap replacement too, like everything else. But um, I thought it was an awesome monitor, and I had it next to my PVM and I liked them both. Different types of tubes, so it looked different. Somebody might say they liked one over the other, but that's just preference. So uh, yeah, short answer to that. The, the best one and uh, the best difference to look for is whatever looks best to you. <laughs> Mark Main just got a Vectrix and a bunch of games for $70. That is a great price. Uh, the retention clip for the controller is broken and it's missing a foot and a couple games are missing the overlays. Do you know anywhere I can get high quality overlays? Uh, yeah, I, I posted about this just a month or two ago. So just search retro RGB for Vectrix and you'll see the link. Um, I've been, I haven't bought those before, but I've been told those are very, very high quality overlays. Um, also, they don't know if there's a recommended shop. I think there's a few that have a reputation of being very good. Um, and the closest thing to the retention clip they could find is an STL file, but they couldn't find anyone selling, nor could you find anybody selling replacement feet. Um, yeah, if there's a 3D printed file, you could probably just find one of those places that does 3D printing for you and just have it made or ask a friend or something to, to print those for you. Uh, as far as any Vectrix tips and tricks, I would, I would just do some Googling on that. When I had one for a while, uh, I believe I had it recapped. 
Um, I think I had the the mod done that uh, that quiets it up because I think there's like a buzz that you can get. It didn't really bother me, but uh, a friend of mine was working on it and offered to do it. So I said, what the heck, let's just do it. But I, I would kind of just Google Vectrix and, and see. Vectrix Roly is a YouTube channel that talks a lot about it. Um, so I, I think I would just kind of go through and see the options available and see if there's anything that might apply to you. But overall, if it's in good working condition other than just the feet, I mean, I would open it up and make sure the caps aren't leaking, but it should be pretty good. Drew said they're doing some maintenance on their consoles and they're curious about cap replacements for the two-chip Super Nintendo and one-chip SNES Mini. They're both missing C67 and C52, which is present on the Japanese versions. Um, they read this was a cost-cutting measure for North American, North American consoles, but can't find anything concrete on whether or not they should add this cap back. Any thoughts? So this is all going from memory. I do not, you know, please do not quote me on this one. Uh, I think those may have been extra filtering that really wasn't necessary. Um, so I would just pick up the cap replacement kits from console five and use whatever comes in those. And if there, uh, if you had stuff that wasn't populated, I would kind of just leave it as is. Um, because remember, I mean, these things are, are many, many years old and they've been running totally fine. I, you know, I have a couple of unmodded SNESs that are perfect. So, you know, there's certainly no no um, safety issues by not having them there. Uh, and, you know, I would do some more research on it. But when we were doing the white line test, I think, you know, the so the on all black screens on some Super Nintendo consoles, you'll occasionally get a weird white line straight down the middle. And one of the things that we did was just check everything related to the power circuit and i vaguely vaguely remember populating those spots and it didn't do anything to the white line um i could i could be remembering this wrong we're talking four years ago now and a lot of research in the super N nintendo before and after that but it's just it's my opinion that if you're if you're looking to just replace the caps for um, longevity reasons just buy the cap kit from console 5 use whatever it comes with and you know i, I can't imagine there would be any issues past that Oliver Clare wants to know if there's any reason to get an open source scan converter if you already own a FrameMeister. Um, that's a tricky one. The easy answer is it processes color better and there's zero lag. However, it might not be compatible with every TV and every output mode, whereas the FrameMeister is compatible with everything. Um, you know, it's really up to you. The one thing about the lag that I will say is in all of the tests over all of the years that I've done on the FrameMeister, the lag is solid. It doesn't vary. It doesn't jump from one and a quarter frames to four frames to two frames back to one. It's always at, you know, like one and a quarter, one and a half frames. Um, so because of that, you could just adjust even, you know, pro players could just adjust their uh, their timing around that. You don't even really know you're doing it. You basically just play your favorite game for 10 minutes. And next thing you know, your brain's already compensated. Um, so it's, you know, it's really just comes down to features. You know, is there anything, if you look through the whole spec list of the OSSC, is there anything there that you think is better than the Frame Meister? You know, do you have consoles where you could set the phase on every one of them and have custom timings? Or would you rather just use the Firebrand X profiles and the FrameMeister and not worry about it. I honestly, if you, I, I would not ever tell anybody to buy a FrameMeister just because of cost. No other reason at all. You know, if you're saying I'm just getting into retro gaming, I want either a retro tank, an OSSC, or a FrameMeister. Which one? My answer would be not the FrameMeister. Let's look at features on the other two. But it's only because of price. Um, you know, they're just you could buy both of those other things for the cost of it. But if you already own it. I don't know. I don't I don't know if I would really have a reason to get rid of it, especially if your situation, your workflow, your setup is already going well for you. So maybe just look deeper into it and see if there's anything you could find that would make you want to go one way or the other. Robert Dickinson said it was recommended that they remove their legitimate GDMU and replace it with the GD-ROM when updating firmware for the GC for the DC Digital. Um, at their skill level, they can do that and they plan to have the X station and PS digital installed. Is it perfectly safe to update firmware over Wi-Fi for the PS digital while having the X station installed? Um, so two answers for that. First, uh, yeah, a hundred percent safe to deal with the PS one digital without messing with the X station. Uh, I've done it 
four times since I got my prototype unit, and there's never been an issue whatsoever. Uh, Dan's never mentioned it to me, and neither is Rama. So, um, and they are all aware that I have both in the same. And every time I talk to them on both the X Station and the DC Digital, it's just yeah, go ahead and update. You know, I don't think I've ever had an issue. Um, the only suggestion for that is for installers if you're going to do both, do one first test it then do the other just because a lot of people were doing both at the same time and running into issues and then in help troubleshooting no one could figure out where the issue started but that has nothing to do with firmware uh the other thing is i can't ever remember hearing uh that you should remove the gdmu when replacing the dc digital and i've also updated mine i don't know five or six times since I got it. And I've also bounced back and forth between the different firmwares, um, the one with HQ2X and the other one, I forgot the names that Christoph made for the firmware, but the, like the official and the unofficial or something like that. Um, I bounced between development firmware and, and uh, you know, regular release to the public firmware. And I don't think I've ever actually had an original disk drive in my, uh, the DC digital Dreamcast that I have. So, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious where you heard that. It could very well be that I, I, I was supposed to put the disk drive back in and just never did, uh, but I certainly haven't had any issues, and I don't know anybody else that has. So maybe double-check where you heard that, and if I'm wrong, by all means, please let me know. I'll update my documentation or something, but I don't think that would be a worry on either of those products. Retro Gaming Boombox is working on a new setup, and they're having issues. They have an NEC XM29+, Plus, an Xtron Crosspoint, and HD retrovision cables for Genesis and Super Nintendo. It was passing signal, but the green was overpowering. They tried their CDX SCART cable to their SCART to BNC adapter, and the picture's perfect. Is component not supported, and would you need some kind of transcoder? Uh, yes, that's exactly the problem. I owned an XM29, and it does not support component video in at all. Uh, at least the model I had. Maybe some other ones? Um... I actually have both the transcoders right here. I wonder which one this is. Yeah, this is the comp to RGB. This is exactly the one that you would want. Uh, it's right on the RetroTINK site, and I believe on Amazon as well. Uh, and that would just go from component video to SCART. And then uh, you could put that right into the rest of your setup. There's other converters out there that would go to VGA if you want to use the VGA input on your NEC. I believe Linux Bot 3000 has one like that. Um, actually, I have. I have the. Oh no, I have the. Other, I have the other one. I have the RGB to uh, to component video. One of those. I haven't put this on the scope yet, but everybody I've talked to said theirs has worked really well. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, you know, you might want to look into the Linux Bot one if you just want to have a different. Sorry, if you just want to have a different cable setup, uh, but if you already have like a SCART to BNC adapter, then that's everything that you would need so uh it's probably the best solution and i by the way i loved my xm29 and now that i've gotten more friends that are better at working on monitors than i am i really regret selling it it was an excellent condition it was really clear i absolutely loved it and you know with the friends i have now i probably could have just brought it to them replaced the you know the power board or just rebuilt the power board and would have still had a working one so it's an excellent monitor if it ever drives you crazy let me know and i'll gladly buy it off you <laughs> Jaegers 1994 had a very long question about cabling and setup. Uh, I read the whole thing, but just out of respect of everybody else's time, I'm just going to jump to the answers. Um, so they have a setup with a bunch of consoles going into a G-SCART switch. One of them is going to be output to a RetroTINK 2X SCART, and the other one's going into their BVM. So they want to know, can a SCART cable be too long? And uh, you know, what are the length of these cables supposed to be? In a situation like this, it's my very strong suggestion that you have the switch as close to your BVM as possible and get just your standard three foot, two foot, whatever the ones that you get, you know, from retro gaming cables or, you know, that one eBay seller, just get your standard uh, SCART to BNC adapter um, and make sure it's close enough for that. Um, as with every analog signal, the longer the signal travels, the more the signal degrades. Um, as for outputting to the retro tank, these SCART adapters should be out soon. You know, uh, I've been talking about these for almost a year now, uh, and they might finally be available for sale. But when you see these things, essentially envision yourself a two-inch SCART cable. So as a result, it's the least amount of signal degradation. So if you plugged in uh, your 
retro tink 2x scart into that into your g scart and then just carefully you know you got to make sure cable management isn't putting stress on the switch but then just run a long hdmi cable you should be fine um you know there are some if you go like 25 to 50 feet you might have issues with hdmi but there's other ways around that there's repeaters there's different cables you could buy um and it either works or it doesn't really like if you plug it in and you get a bunch of green speckles and then no signal then you know it doesn't work uh but it's not like if it works and you don't get any dropouts, it's not like the HDMI side of the signal would be dimmer or anything like that. It's fully digital. So that's definitely it. Um, you also talked about resistors in the sync line on different cables. And I mean this very respectfully, but you're definitely overthinking it. All you need to think about is all of these consoles, Super Nintendo, N64, Genesis, they output video signals from their connectors. Um, most of these require components in the cable to make that the proper signal. Because if you think about it, if Super Nintendo, you know, included those extra parts on every single Super Nintendo so that the cable is just a pass through, that might add 25 cents cost to each times 20 million. That's a lot of, you know, that's millions of dollars lost just for something that most people wouldn't use. So they very smartly put these components in the cables. Uh, we, as the retro gaming community, figured out what's the best components to use, if there's anything that you could tweak it to. So essentially, you just need to worry about making sure that you're sending the correct voltage to things. So as long as you've purchased cables from reputable retailers or resellers, there is no issue whatsoever. You can go back to a video I did a few years ago that teaches you how to check them without an oscilloscope, you know, what to look for on the inside. All you would need is a an $8 multimeter just to see, check resistance and see if there's a capacitor in there and stuff like that. But generally speaking, if you've bought cables in the past year or two, this isn't even an issue whatsoever. Um, the only thing with N64, which you mentioned, mentioned is if somebody did the mod correctly and c-sync is hooked up it's it essentially will output the exact same signal as a super nintendo so the same cable could be used for both uh, as long as it's all ntsc pal and ntsc is the only difference um, and if you have any question about that there is a universal scart cable that you could get from retro gaming cables that just works on everything uh, including gamecube uh, pal gamecubes of course because ntscs don't output rgb so i just i wouldn't overthink that too much i would either make sure you've bought a cable in the past year or two or go back open up your cables check the components and don't worry about anything else about that stuff especially things like sync on luma with the ps1 and all that in the setup that you're talking about none of that's going to matter uh, as long as you didn't buy cheap one dollar cables from aliexpress or something like that jason guffey said i'm probably late so here's hoping i made it in time well i was late today so there you go you made it <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago they made a post talking about blowing a fuse on their ossc and needing to buy replacements they managed to get some, but they were so small that they were very hard to work with. I have good eyesight, but not good enough for this something this small. My question is, what sort of tools do you recommend for soldering work like this? I see various stands with grips for PCBs, magnifying lenses, and lighting, but their prices and quality seem to vary wildly. I'm also wondering if I could possibly solder to the, uh, the new fuse to some small wires instead of right to the board to give myself a little bit more space to work with. I'm not sure if fuses need to be directly attached to the board for whatever reason, um, and they're still kind of a newbie regarding this stuff. So I don't think it would hurt, but I probably would go right to the board. Um, with stuff like that, a magnifying glass of any kind is always a really great thing to have. Um, I had one of those visors that like 10 bucks on eBay that you could flip down where you could change whichever magnifier is in there. Um, I think I gave that to Jose because I, I didn't use it so much because all of the stuff that required a magnifying glass, I just would end up giving him to work <laughs> on anyway. Uh, and I could do it. I've done it. I've, I've done it well, shockingly enough, but, um, stuff anytime stuff gets a little complicated time is the biggest factor for me personally and you know unless you really enjoy modding this is something you should consider as well because if i'm modding something that's very complicated and i make a mistake then i have to go back and check every single thing that i did and then if i made if i broke something if i ripped a trace if i did something that's just slightly out of my skill level 
I'm going to have to pay one of my friends to do it anyway. So I just kind of thought overall, unless it's something I'm really in the mood to do and I think would be fun, uh, or, or if it's just a quick thing that I know for a fact that, you know, there's no way I could mess this up. I've done a million of them. I generally have been giving that stuff to Jose because overall, like if I end up taking two hours to mod something and then an hour to troubleshoot what I did wrong and then another two hours to fix something and let's say I don't even fix it. Let's just say I finally discover that I ripped a trace up and or I, I broke a pin off of a chip. That's, a, that's something that happens to everybody that mods at some point. So then do I take out my Dremel and try to grind the chip down and go to that? And at that point, the, the work that I would have to pay Jose to do would be more expensive and more time consuming than just dropping the thing off to him and saying, hey man, could you just mod this for me and send me the bill? So that, you know, while I joke about that, it is 100% true. So if you want to get into modding if it's something that you think you would enjoy and you think it's something that would be fun to spend your time doing uh, as many people do and as I do for certain things get yourself a magnifying glass helmet from eBay or or even just basically a magnifying glass if you don't want to have something strapped to your head uh, make sure just as always you get a good iron and good tips and you do not need to spend a million bucks on this. I've talked about this a lot. Just go to the modding tools section of the website. I link to that Kesker iron and the tips that I've been using for since Voltar found it. Um, and I, I've just, my soldering in general has gotten a million times better just by switching to that. Um, and little like, um, like super tiny tweezers. That's another thing that I found. Uh, and I got three or four different kinds cause I found that sometimes, um, uh, depending on what I'm doing and, you know, depending on, I guess, what I'm holding, my hands would feel better with one than the other. So I bought a whole bunch of different types of tweezers like that. Um, cheap too, you know, like one of these, you buy them off of Amazon for a buck each and I bought 10 of them or something. So, you know, tools will make all the difference in stuff like that. So I, I would kind of just invest in the right magnifying glass, get some good tools, get some good tweezers, or just decide hey, by the time I spend all of this money, I could have just sent it out to one of, you know, one of the reputable models, Re reputable modders. <laughs> I don't even know what word just came out of my mouth, but, <laughs> uh, you know, just, you know, especially with the OSSC, I think they have repair shops and stuff like that and people that have done this a million times. So I would just kind of decide based on that. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thank you so much to everybody that supports on any one of these platforms. And if you're new to the support services or the Q&As, ask absolutely any question you would like. Just please post it wherever the newest Q&A post is on any of the support services. The way these work, I can't really go back and sift through older ones. Uh, so just go to whatever the newest one is, ask your question there. And if for whatever reason I don't answer, uh, it's either that the question came in after I already started recording these or if uh, I just deleted it in post by accident, which has definitely happened a few times in the past. So thanks again, and I'll see you next week.